guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Tita Lavinia of Tita's Pageantry and for this episode, I will be bringing you the review of the evening gown seen at Binibini Pilipinas 2021. So please make sure you stick around, please subscribe to the channel as well as hit that bell notification button for your weekly pageant picks. So, there are 13 girls and I've ranked all of the um, gown looks to top 13. So I'm going to start with my 13th girl and she is Miss Manila Patricia Garcia. Now Patricia wore a yellow gown, a predominantly yellow gown by Michael Leva. Now let me just give you a little bit of information about this gown. So um, Pat and I, we correspond, um, you know, we have like a good rapport with each other and some of the members of her team are also good friends of mine and I was able to see this gown a few weeks before the coronation night. At around the time that I saw this gown, I had some input on what could be changed or, you know, how it could be presented um, the best way it can on the Binibini Filipina stage and at that time I thought that they were going to do minor tweaks to the gown. Now I was really very careful in suggesting these um, changes because of course Michael Leva is an established designer and you can't just tell Michael Leva to remove the sleeves or remove parts of his design. So I did make some suggestions and unfortunately they weren't able to um, incorporate those suggestions. So what Pat wore to the actual show was the gown that was originally made for her. There were no changes. So I feel that yellow is a really, really nice color. Um, Pat's gown was yellow on one side and it had a mesh, an embellished mesh detail on the other. I just felt that the sleeve um, just wasn't crisp enough because I knew that Pat wanted to go with a direction that was more on the Filipiniana side. So I felt that maybe the sleeve could have been a lot sturdier or crisper or I don't know um, or it could have had more structure to it but more than that I felt that the gown was just a little too busy I felt that if they could just zero in on either just the color or one element of the gown and maybe make it just a little longer than usual it would have been ranked a lot higher. 12 spot for me goes to the Cinderella story, the dark horse of this edition, Cinderella Obianita of Misamis and Cagayan de Oro City. Now, her gown was made by one of the pillars of fashion, Rene Salud, and she was in a sky blue gown. Now, based on her description, she wanted to wear a gown that was um, inspired by the blue sky, and I think they were able to achieve this. Now, for the gown itself, there wasn't anything... Um, offensive or worth noting about the gown. I thought that the gown looked really pretty on her. It really elongated her because Cindy is actually one of the tallest this edition. And what I liked about the gown is that it was simple enough and that you could just really see Cindy perform. Is it a spectacular gown? Probably not. Is this something that I've seen before? Yes, I have. But I think that with Cindy, it really didn't matter because I feel like if she goes into more of her time to transform and to learn about other designers out there then she would have more of a grip on her personal style so this one is a good gown choice for Cindy because it is also very reminiscent of the color of dress that Cinderella wore for the ball at the um, yeah the Cinderella movie so I just like how everything is so serendipitous with Cindy's look Next, my number 11 spot goes to the beautifully luminous Francesca Taro. Now, she was in the Bench Leguiab gown, and there was really no surprise to this, guys, because when uh, Francesca competed in China a few years ago, she also wore a gown by Pampanga-based designer Bench Leguiab. Unfortunately, though, I wasn't able to place Francesca's gown a lot higher because although I feel that the fit is really good on Fran, although I felt that her skin was really showcased in the gown, I've seen this gown design before. I mean, not the exact gown design. It's just that a bench does have a very distinct signature, and I feel like I've seen um, versions of this gown before. And I just cannot wrap my head around doing a design in the same green shade as Hannah Arnold from last um, edition in 2019, who was in the running for Miss International back then. So, it wasn't received very well, Hannah's gown in 2019, so just wasn't so sure about the thought process on why um, the design team or bench would put um, 
Francesca in the same type of gown, in the same shade for a girl who is gunning for, you know, the same title. So, yeah, maybe just a little bit of some change with the gown work. And I also felt that it was just a little too open on at least the chest area. So, yeah, if they could at least cover this one up a little bit. And let me just say, for this edition, there were a number of gowns who had a lot of references um, to Catriona Gray's Lava Gown as well as Pia's. And for Fran, at least the side of her dress really reminded me of the back detail on Pia's gown. Number 10 on my list goes to the elegant Patricia Babista, who wore a white uh, Paolo Blanco. Now, again, there is no surprise to this tandem because Pat Babista had worn um, Paolo Blanco in the past. Now, this time around, she wore a fully beaded dress, um, a fully beaded mesh dress that had a wave pattern, and um, it was long sleeved and it was a column dress that really showcased Pat's height. And I really like Pat's styling. It was young, it was fresh. However, I was just really missing... Um, that alta factor that I once saw for Pat um, when she competed in, if I'm not mistaken, Binibining uh, Nyog Nyogan. She was also in a white dress, but I felt that she was more regal in that competition um, as compared to this. So for me, even if everything worked, the hair, makeup, even the dress, I just felt that it wasn't um, impactful enough to be propelled to at least the top spots in terms of gown. It was a safe choice. It was a really good choice because of her skin color. But yeah, I wish they could have played more in terms of styling, in terms of the gown design for Pat. Number nine! I'm really excited about number nine only because I know that this is a, a very polarizing look. But let me try to defend this look a little bit. I'm talking about Honey Cartosano of Rizal. Now, her gown was made, of course, by the fabulous Paolo Ballesteros. And if you're new to pageantry, maybe this is something that you would um, accept. If you're a little bit of an old school in pageantry, maybe it will take time for you to really absorb what this gown represents or what this gown is trying to convey. So um, according to the... Uh, voiceover. This gown was designed by Paolo Ballesteros with the grandeur of um, the Manila Carnival or the Manila Carnival Queens in mind. Now, in fairness to them, I really see the reference. I see the pearls. I see the patterns. I see all of the dance um, references from the 1920s as well as the art deco um, you know, imagery from the 1920s and the 1930s at around the time the carnivals were prevalent in the country. So I really like the thought process. It was fun. It was directional. It was theatrical. It was risky. Now, again, was this even a good move? Maybe not. I mean, it gave us a different flavor, yes. It was something that was just totally different from all of the other girls who pushed for elegance, who pushed for classic looks. But Honey did something really different. She wanted to be talked about. She didn't want to be, you know, someone who just blended in with everyone else. And she definitely stood out. And even that performance was a standout. Her S-lines were clean. Her strides were clean. Her face was just serving us, I don't know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. So, you know, you had everything there. It's just that it might have gone a little cost to me this time. So I just wish that they could have pulled back and they could have um, really reined in Honey and gave her a really elegant look the same way that Honey presented herself in one of the photo shoots with Leo Almodal. She was in a red gown that I'm going to show you. I thought she was really pretty. I thought that was um, pageant ready and I also thought that it was a good way to showcase Honey's short hair because this was something I missed for Honey's performance. They totally did away with the fact that Honey cut her hair this way. I really would have wanted something fresh for the competition. So, moving on, my eighth spot goes to Josh Dimaculangan in her sister's uh, collaboration. Her sister is a designer named Cheryl Vicente. Now, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this gown. It was nicely made. The design was good. It was very current. It's a type of gown that a lot of these... Um, social influencers would wear. It's corseted, it's very feminine, it's very romantic. It um, is in a periwinkle blue color, so I think that the garment itself could just be replicated and worn in other events. I think, um, you know, it would still work. However, my issue with the whole um, presentation, at least for Josh, was that it 
dulled a little bit of Josh's shine. Does that make sense? I mean, when I think of Josh Di Makulangan, I think of someone fiery. I think of the colors red and gold. So for me to see her in this muted tone, for me to see her more um, explore her romantic side, um, yeah, I, I just felt a little bit disconnected because I really expected her to go for the gold. I mean, literally, to go for something really fiery. So yeah, um, it just fizzled a little bit. But and then we move on to my number seven spot, and I'm going to give this to the uber sexy Grishella Lima. Now, Grishella wore one of the dresses by uh, designer Louis Pangilinan. Um, Sir Louis did two dresses for this competition, and one of them was worn by Grishella Lima. They called this gown Liab, and I feel like the gown is just so well fitted. Um, it was just really perfect for Grishella's body type. It was really vavoom on vavoom. However, my only issue with this gown is even with the beautiful make of it, even with the beautiful structure, even with the story behind it because they say that the name of the gown is called Liab and that this was um, inspired by San Telmo or St. Elmo's fire, a type of fire, a mythical fire that um, is a harbinger of good fortune or good omen. So, you know, it's it's like a good, it's a good sign. But I just feel like no one really tapped them on the shoulder and said it kind of looks like a mashup of Catriona's gown. So I just felt um, that they could have opened their eyes and, you know, recognize that, hey, the shape might have been a little too lava gown for me and maybe the details is just a little bit too Adarna or a little bit too um, Sari Manok for me. So, you know, just really nitpicking because the colors revolved around orange and reds and I don't know, by this time, I'm a little bit saturated with all of the Catriona references. So, yeah, but other than that, good gown, really good fit. Next, number six on my spot, I will give this to the stunning Maureen Montaigne. I mean, this is a face that you cannot deny. And even if, you know, she had a little bit of a slow start with the styling because I felt that, you know, there were some last minute changes that were made because we had reports in the morning that she had a different hairstyle. By evening, it was parted in the middle and I felt that the shape wasn't exactly what I envisioned Maureen would look like. So I don't know if there were last minute changes, but... The gown itself, um, to be honest, I saw versions of this gown, again, a few weeks prior. I was shown the gown um, just to see if uh, I could add, you know, my input to some of um, yeah, some of the looks that they were looking at. Um, Maureen and her team were looking at two gowns. Initially, the first gown was very similar to Gazzini's gown during um, Miss Universe Philippines, the, the cinched waist, the one with the mermaid um, hem, and then this gown by Ador Feliciano, the fully beaded gown. So I initially suggested that, you know, maybe a lot of the ladies would wear bling. So if they don't want to blend in, maybe they could go with a gown with just the killer shape with hardly any embellishments. But they went for the ombre gown that was made by Ador Feliciano. Did I like the gown? I absolutely liked the gown. I mean, the make was just so impeccable. The ombre work um, in cognac, in shades of brown, in amber I thought that it worked really well it's just that if you put them all together it sort of aged Maureen it sort of um, gave the whole look an evening wear sort of feel not a pageant gown sort of feel if that makes sense. I mean, I feel like this is something a society lady would wear at maybe an opera or maybe a ballet performance, but for the pageant stage, I wish that they could have really given Maureen that sex factor, that sex appeal factor, because I was really missing, um, I, I feel like I was missing a little bit of danger with um, the neckline or maybe a little bit of skin, because yeah, there were was hardly <laughs> skin that was shown, so I, I I just hope that they could have banked on Maureen's um, innate sex appeal, yeah, if that's a better explanation. And um, because, you know, even if they tried to package Maureen for Miss International and just give her, like, the softest looks, we would always revert back to a Maureen that's more polished, that's really pretty, achingly pretty, and then, you know, um, give her a look that you know, that's more vintage. I mean, if I were to choose which look would fit Maureen for the finals, I would choose this pink look that um, she wore for one of the photo shoots at Pinipini Pilipinas. She was in a pink dress. 
I wish they would have gone to that direction. Number five on my list, I will give that to Karen Laurie Mendoza. Now, her gown was made by uh, Iloilo-based designer Sydney Ekula. I'm sorry if I'm butchering that. And I like that this gown um, also had a meaning. It was uh, very close to just the idea of an ilonga, uh, red and black uh, were dominant colors for the gown. And um, it says that it has something to do with being passionate and being determined and, you know, that fiery love that we ilongas um, offer to everyone. And I, I like the idea. It's just that it didn't quite translate as well on TV because I feel like if you do it on TV and if the set is, you know, has the same color as your dress, you're kind of lost in translation there. So I felt that we could have had um, like a nicer pop of color for her. It was just too dramatic. It was just too Bram Stoker's Dracula for me. And the dress itself I like. It's just that Karen, I feel, wasn't able to really showcase the dress because of the limited time, because of the darkness of everything. And because um, I feel like she was drowning in it a little bit so maybe it had something to do with the design um, direction uh, I guess if they're going to give it a try next time around to lessen the fabrics on Karen and maybe really showcase on Karen's length and her long limbs because I lost this a little bit she felt like she was drowning in fabric while in fact the dress was really really nice Next, uh, ha, my number four spot goes to the beautiful Meiji Cruz, who wore the second Louis Pangilinan gown of the evening. Now, I really like Meiji's gown. It was red. It was fiery. Again, it did have that Catriona element. I don't know. I don't know if this was even a conscious decision. But what I like about this gown was that Meiji has been reserving red for the finals. I mean, she has been doing a lot of really good things in terms of releasing photo shoots and, you know, those pandars. And I just felt that they have been very deliberate in not choosing red in any of their photo shoots so to wear red for the night that it mattered I thought it was a really really good move and I really like the idea that um, it was red for a purpose like even her earrings even her accessories which were made by Sir Manny Halasan um, they were rubies and I felt that these are just little touches that make the whole look work. The only thing that I will note though is however much I love the dress on Meiji, I felt that this was a design that I've seen before. Again, this has Sir Louis signature, like the hip part with the undulating um, uh, like layering of structured fabric with a drop of maybe a fabric or tool on one side. I felt like I've seen this a lot this fashion season. So I'm not saying give it a rest. I'm just saying that yeah, I wanted to see more. I wanted to see a different direction. But was it a successful look? Yes, it was. It was absolutely a successful look. Number three for me, I will give this to another surprising winner. This is, of course, Samantha Panlilio, who wore Ezra Couture. Now, there's really very little for me to say about Samantha's gown. All I can say is that it is just so perfect for her because we all know that Samantha is privileged. We all know that Samantha has the resources. So for her to wear Ezra Couture is not something far-fetched. I mean, this is something really believable for a Samantha Panlilio. What I'm just saying is that it's understated. It's not screaming wealth. I mean, I like that it was beaded. I like that it was lace and that the gown was just simple It um, simple in itself. It had a little bit of ruching. It gave Samantha that beautiful S-line. It really hugged her frame. And what I liked about this dress is that it didn't compete with any of the other elements of Samantha's styling, not her face, not her hair, not her body, not her stance, not her poses. So it was just there to support Samantha. It wasn't there to overpower Samantha. Number two goes to the biggest winner of the night, and this is, of course, Hannah Arnold, who won Binibini Pilipinas International. Now, again, Hannah was directional. I mean... Just like what Pia said, Hannah seemed to really charge this competition like a horse with blinders because she didn't seem to be competing with the other lady. She seemed to be competing for her personal best. And I feel that her competition was herself in 2019. So I really like the idea that Hannah was able to wear the color she wanted. I felt that she wasn't so happy in 2019 because this was a color that was just shoved into her. Um, I felt that she didn't really have a lot of say in terms of styling directions back in 2019. But in um, 2021, with all of her resources, with all of the people wanting to help her, I think she found a really good match with Sir Leo Almodal. So let me decode this look. Now, um, 
there is no surprise about this tandem because Hannah has done modeling work for Sir Leo and um, we have seen a lot of these gowns on Hannah. So we know that, you know, somewhere along the line, um, Sir Leo will be very involved in Hannah's um, pageant journey. And when Hannah first came out on the screen, just like you, I was a little bit confused. I didn't understand what the Quincinera part was all about and then just like you I was also very surprised when she twirled and took out the skirt and then revealed a fabulous dress underneath that was just a column cut that was fully embellished it was asymmetric on one side so it had all the trappings of a Leo Almodal dress now what I like about this dress is that even if this isn't my cup of tea I felt that everything on Hannah made it current, made it fresh, made it young. Had the dress been on its own, I think it would have looked dated. I think it would have looked um, mature. But paired with Hannah's styling, that innocent face, that, you know, easy, long tresses, even the beautiful pink jewelry, I felt that it was a little blatant, yes, but I felt that it was just so perfect for the part. I mean, if you want to audition for the part, and you know, it doesn't matter if people say, hey, she's like overselling herself, it doesn't matter because for me, Hannah absolutely looked the part that night. So, yeah, good for Hannah. Um, maybe my little um, thing that I would love to impart if they are receptive to some of the things that I'll be saying is that, yeah, pull back on um, things that have been done by previous representatives because it falls back to Hannah. There was an incident with her national costume the last time that she joined. And then this time around, um, she took inspiration from Mariam Habach as well as uh, Sofia Aragon from Miss Universe uh, 2019. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like if you're going to take inspiration from the moves of other people, then you should be able to do it um, cleanly or execute this um, the best way you can. So, yeah, I really wasn't overwhelmed, but you know what? Just one performance and everything changed. And I never thought I'd see this performance the way it was presented because. You know, after Catriona in 2018, yeah, I thought we wouldn't have another gown moment. And then Gazzini came along in that absolutely fabulous pink dress by Sir Gary Santiago. So I really wasn't expecting the same moment. And lo and behold, very early on, number one spot goes, of course, to the statuist Gabriel Bashano of Barongan, Eastern Samar, who wowed the crowd with that beautifully made pearlized gown with a hood. I mean, yes, she was Mama Mary personified. She was Ariana David. Miss Italy 1994, I mean, she was couture, she was drama, it was theatrical, but you know what, a lot of the designers now look up to the likes of Thierry Mugler when they do a lot of these, you know, fashion looks for um, the international stage or maybe the local um, pageants, but this time around, I felt that the whole look was just more reminiscent of how Jean-Paul Gaultier would do, um, you know, his fashionable looks. It's a little theatrical, a little dramatic, but, you know, still wearable, still very elegant, and I like this with Gabby Bashano. Now, the people who um, did her gown are members of her team there they have been very loyal to each other but i like that you know they're very under the table they are not established names in pageantry ken batino i felt did a really really good job in keeping a very low profile not overselling the idea and just giving us results and this was a result of a corseted gown that was just fully beaded with linear pearls attached to a snood and i'm really very excited about the snood because this was a type of headgear or headwear that was prevalent during the Renaissance period. So this was popularized by the ladies of the English and the French court, but it was actually the ladies of the Italian court who took it to another level and put a lot of pearls, put a lot of detailed work in their hairstyles. So for me to see this interpreted in a modern way and make it fashion and make it, you know, into an iconic uh, moment in Philippine pageantry, then yes, I am all for it. Now, if they put Gabby on reserve this time, and if the team who made Gabby's gown would have more time to um, brainstorm, more time to really hone their craftsmanship as well as their skills in putting together garments, I have no idea um, what they will put out next year should Gabby desire. Uh, 
decide to join again. So there you go, guys. I was not overwhelmed, but I was really happy that everything was washed away by Gabby Bashano's beautiful gown and gown performance. So there you go, guys. Um, again, this one closes the chapter of Binibining Pilipinas for me. I will move on to other pageantry things. But before I go, I just want to thank my iconic star hair extensions family for my beautiful hair and for making sure that my hair is colored and healthy and I also want to thank Sir Oli Sara for the easy breezy dress. I wore this dress today because this is a special um, review for the gown so I thought I'd pretty up. And of course, Pai, thank you for the wonderful accessories. Thank you so much, guys.